Hello everyone and welcome to CRAM Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you Crumb Search from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. So, we've talked about randomized clinical trials before. There are a couple of uh, um, YouTube videos on that. Um, and I'll, I'll therefore presume uh, you have some uh, insight into randomized controlled trials. And I'm going to talk um, today about just a couple of important limitations of randomized controlled trials. So this is not an exhaustive discussion of all limitations. I think we'll need to do another um, talk to cover all of the limitations. So uh, you probably know that RCTs are the gold standard in study design. Uh, RCTs do have flaws, but this is considered to be the best of what is available. And they form the basis of systematic reviews and meta-analysis, which are what we refer to as the level one evidence. So, um, and you have to do RCTs um, if you require, um, if you think that your new innovation or intervention um, ought to be recommended in clinical practice and be incorporated into guidelines. And also um, having data from RCTs really provides a basis of uh, um, decision-making um, your discussions with the patients based uh, usually um, should be based on results of RCTs if they're available, and you take patient values and preferences into account and then uh, make your decisions. However, there are some issues with RCTs, and we're going to discuss a couple today. The most important thing um, you need to think about when you're looking at an RCT is external validity. So if you assume that the RCT has been uh, done to a really good standard, um, if you think that they've done, uh, they've done their best to avoid biases as much as they possibly can, then you're thinking whether you can apply the results of the RCTs to your own practice. That is what we mean by um, the phrase external validity, right? So I'm gonna to talk to you very briefly about an example um, from uh, my own area of expertise, which is in thyroid cancer. There's this paper on thyroidectomy with or without radioiodine in patients with low-risk thyroid cancer that was published just a few months ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. So when you um, see or come across a paper in the NEJM, you think, oh, that must be of really good quality. That's something that uh, we've got to uh, look into and uh, see if we can apply the results to our practice. So what they did, did in this NEGM paper, and this is a multicenter study in France, where they compared um, people with low-risk thyroid cancer who had radioiodine with people who did not have radioiodine. So essentially, they're looking at the value of radioiodine ablation after total thyroidectomy in patients with low-risk thyroid cancer, just to see if radioiodine was essential. So this was a non-inferiority trial. Uh, with the hope uh, of proving non-inferiority in the no radioiodine group. And therefore, uh, if that was the case, then we could avoid uh, radioiodine in these low-risk patients. And uh, I'll go straight to the results of the trials. Um, essentially, they're looking at events, cancer-related events at three years, and they showed that there wasn't a significant difference in the events. When we say events, we mean cancer recurrence in one form or the other and they found no difference uh, in uh, uh, the two groups, the, the group that did not have radioiodine and the group that had radioiodine after total thyroidectomy for low-risk thyroid cancer. And here's another uh, figure that again shows the different types of events, cancer-related events, and in thyroid cancer, when we, when we talk about um, events, we mean either structural events when there are there is obvious evidence of recurrent cancer on imaging and on biopsy. Sometimes we talk about functional events. That means there is radioiodine uptake uh, when you give um, iodine um, to these patients. And the third kind of event is a biologic event, which essentially refers to the tumor marker, i.e. thyroglobulin, 
uh, going up in patients and that being a marker of biochemical recurrence. So essentially, there's no difference in the event rate between the no radioiodine group and the radioiodine group. Okay, so um, that uh, sounds really good. So essentially, you will think that um, if you go by the NEGM trial and follow their conclusions, then you probably do not need to give radioiodine uh, in these patients because that's what the conclusion says, that uh, follow-up alone without radioiodine was not inferior to radioiodine therapy uh, over a three-year period. <clears throat> However, if you look into the methodology and go through the details of surgery that these patients had, so we said thyroidectomy, um, but what about the extent of thyroidectomy and the possibility that some of these patients may have had a lymph nodal dissection? And it transpires that over 40% of these patients in this trial had a neck dissection. And when we say neck dissection, we mean either a central neck dissection, which is dissection of lymph nodes around the thyroid and in the thyroid bed, and a lateral neck dissection, or some people call um, referred to this as selective neck dissection. And over 25% of these patients had a lateral or selective neck dissection. Now, that's really interesting. If you're a thyroid cancer expert or if you're a thyroid surgeon, then you will know that at least in the UK and also in the US, neck dissection isn't necessarily done routinely in low-risk patients. And in fact, the American Thyroid Association uh, um, suggest that neck dissection is not recommended for these low-risk tumors, T1, T2 tumors. So that is a big problem. So if you uh, are in the UK and you do um, total thyroidectomy for these patients and you do not do neck dissection, you really cannot generalize the results of this paper in the NEJM where over 40% of patients had a neck dissection because this is a different group of patients. And as the NEGM paper says, radioiodine is not, not necessary uh, in this group of patients. These group of patients aren't the same that uh, that you will see in the UK where you don't do uh, neck dissections. The other issue um, in this paper was the primary endpoint was what we would call a composite endpoint, which was looking at a variety of cancer-related events, including um, so-called functional events. Now, you might remember that a couple of minutes ago, I said that functional events uh, referred to the presence of radioiodine uptake outside of the neck. And if you think about it, you'll only look for radioiodine uptake in patients who had radioiodine. In patients who did not have radioiodine, there is no scope uh, or for demonstrating uptake uh, with radioiodine. And therefore, these kinds of events are only possible in the radioiodine group. So it's not a fair comparison um, of uh, cancer-related events um, in the iodine group and the no iodine group if you're not going to observe radioiodine uptake in the no iodine group. So I hope that makes sense. So this is a really good example, I thought, um, of a um, trial that is done really well, but um, suffers from the inability to um, generalize the results to populations where the underlying treatment, i.e. the underlying surgical treatment is going to be very different. Okay, so let's move on to another limitation or, or another um, issue with randomized controlled trials. Now, a good thing about randomized controlled trials is that you can evaluate not just the primary outcome, but a range of uh, secondary outcomes in a very rigorous manner. And they can be used to um, help you make decisions. For example, um, you can look at cancer recurrence, you can look at survival, you can look at quality of life, um, you can look at specific side effects of the treatment that you're evaluating and compare them in the different groups in your RCT. However, the question uh, often that arises um, is whether the outcomes that you plan to evaluate have they been fully reported in the trials? And there are a couple of studies um, whose links I provide at the bottom of the screen who have evaluated this specific question in randomized controlled trials that have been published in the literature. And what they find is that the outcome reporting um, in the results section is often incomplete. 
when they compare um, the outcomes that were planned to be analyzed in either these trial protocols or the method sections of the RCTs, when they compare that with what the results actually show, they find that many outcome reporting is incomplete. And the interesting thing is that the incomplete outcome reporting seems to be linked with non-significant results. In other words, if the results uh, for specific outcomes are not significantly different, they don't seem to be reported in full, right? So that is a, a significant problem because you're hoping that uh, RCTs would be transparent about how they're going to uh, uh, report on all the outcomes they plan to measure. Right, the next question is whether outcomes of RCTs are the same as those in real life. Now, you would expect that RCTs would be of better quality compared to observational studies, and that RCTs are less susceptible to bias, and that they produce a more, um, provide a more realistic estimate of the effect of the interventions, right? And therefore, um, you would expect that the results of RCTs would be consistent with the results that you see in real life. And this specific question was explored by uh, a team um, in 2020, and that was when their paper was published. And what they looked at was uh, 19 different treatments in 19 different settings, where at least one RCT and one observational study was available. Uh, they reviewed all of these, um, they reviewed the literature on all of these treatments. And they found, interestingly and reassuringly, that the results from RCTs were not different to the results of observational studies. And if you look at that paper, and this is a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, there was one example that we could all relate to as uh, surgeons or surgical trainees. And that was um, studies comparing laparoscopic versus open appendicectomy. Now I've got this forest plot from that paper um, here on, on the right-hand side of the screen. And this forest plot basically lists the observational studies and the randomized controlled trials and the effects um, and the effect sizes um, comparing laparoscopy and open uh, procedure. And you can see here, if you look at the observational studies and the um, summary effect size of the observational studies, you can see that laparoscopy seems to perform better. And this is with regards to infection rate after appendicectomy. And then if you look at the RCTs, there are a number of RCTs here, and then you've got the um, summary effect size of all of the RCTs combined. And you can see that the summary effect size uh, from RCTs also shows that laparoscopy is better compared to open appendicectomy. And this is very similar to the summary of the observational studies. So that is very good. And that is very reassuring that you've got um, an example here um, where, wherein the results of RCTs seem to be very similar to the results of observational studies. And both of these sets of studies are showing that laparoscopy is better. However, you've got to keep in mind that this doesn't always happen. And I'm going to um, talk about examples from the vascular surgery literature. And anyone who's done uh, any period of time in vascular surgery, uh, hopefully uh, will relate to these examples. The first example is this controversy or debate over whether um, surgical carotid endotrectomy um, is better um, or worse than um, carotid artery stenting for carotid artery stenosis. So if you've done vascular surgery, you will know that the um, surgeons and radiologists debate about this um, and have debated about this for quite some time. So if you look at the RCTs comparing endotrectomy and stenting for stenosis, the RCTs show that there's no difference between stroke and death rates. However, if you look at observational studies, and um, there's a nice uh, paper from two, three years ago that summarized the results of these observational studies and the RCTs, and, uh, and it's clear from the summary of observational studies that the stroke and death rates are much higher after carotid artery stenting. So the interventional radiologists uh, are not too happy about this, understandably, but it looks like in real life, it is not as good 
as what the RCTs would suggest. Okay. Another example um, is the treatment for ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, ruptured AAA. So again, there's a debate about whether endovascular aneurysm repair is better or whether open uh, or the traditional surgical repair is better. And the RCTs show no difference between uh, um, EVAR and open surgical repair in terms of mortality. But the observational studies interestingly show that e with EVAR, you've got a reduced 30-day mortality. Okay, so you can see here, here two examples in surgical literature wherein there is a significant difference between the results of RCTs and the results of observational studies. Now, some might call observational studies real life, while others might say observational studies are much more biased or they have a much uh, greater tendency to produce biased results compared to RCTs. And the other thing you've got to think about is that these observational studies may have been done before RCTs uh, were published, or they might have been done after RCTs were published. And again, the techniques and the technologies might have changed. Now, I think it's worthwhile thinking why we get different results in RCTs and observational studies. So I've listed down some uh, potential reasons specifically relating to the vascular surgery literature. But, but uh, you can extrapolate these, these reasons to lots of other surgical settings. So the first thing is to, uh, is to think about the inclusion and exclusion criteria or the, or the eligibility criteria for RCTs, and also the role that the clinician and the patients play in making a decision of whether to participate in the RCT. Yeah, so you know that clinicians enroll patients into RCTs and they may be biased towards one treatment or the other, and, they, and that bias will significantly impact uh, on whether the patient that they see is going to be enrolled in the RCT or not. And patients will, have, uh, will come with their own perceptions, with their own uh, beliefs, and they will uh, decide whether they're going to get enrolled uh, depending on a variety of influences that they've been subject to. So, um, in some of these EVAR trials, the endovascular aneurysm repair trials, uh, they found that only 20% of patients eligible to get participate in the trial actually took part, okay? So that could account for some of the differences you see between RCTs and observational studies. Another potential reason is uh, the expertise that is available and the potential halo effect that you see in RCTs. What does that mean? Uh, you could argue that RCTs are done in high volume centers, RCTs are done um, in situations where there are experts available to do the ER, um, EVAR or even the open surgery. And therefore, um, the, the people involved in providing treatment in RCTs might be quite different to the people providing the treatment in uh, real life or in observational studies. The other thing to think about is that in RCTs, if you get allocated a particular treatment, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll receive that treatment there would be what we call protocol deviations. And uh, uh, as an example, in one of the EVAR trials, less than 50% of patients allocated to receive EVAR as part of the randomized control trial actually received EVAR, less than 50%. So that's a huge uh, proportion of patients who are not receiving their allocated treatment. And you can imagine how that can significantly affect the results of the RCT. Finally, um, I think it's important to keep in mind that in the real world, although two treatment options may be available, sometimes the clinicians with their expertise and with their judgment would uh, decide that a particular treatment would work more favorably for one patient compared to the other treatment. And therefore, um, in real life, there's a bit more tailoring of treatments to uh, individual uh, situations, patient situations, or the disease situations. So a certain aneurysms may not be suitable for EVA based on the location, the anatomy, patient habitus, and so on and so forth. So um, unlike in RCTs, where if you fit the inclusion exclusion criteria, you will be randomly allocated by the computer in, in uh, observational studies in real life, the, the expert clinician might decide. And in some instances, that might be favorable. Okay. So the next um, thing to discuss um, that I thought would be relevant um, to discussion about outcomes is uh, 
and the impact or the ability of RCTs to study short-term outcomes versus long-term outcomes. Obviously, when, we, when you are designing RCTs, you are limited by the period uh, of follow-up and you will be placing a lot of emphasis on short or medium-term outcomes and long-term outcomes can be difficult to factor in when you're uh, designing RCTs, when you're applying for funding. And, um, and that is a problem because there are certain long-term outcomes that you genuinely be interested in that you simply can't measure. And although you can measure some short-term outcomes, they don't necessarily um, uh, reflect the long-term outcomes, or in other words, short-term outcomes are not necessarily good surrogates for long-term outcomes. And um, a good example of this that I've come across in the surgical literature, because I'm looking for uh, examples from surgical literature to have these discussions, is in the cardiac surgery literature when they discuss the value of coronary artery bypass graft uh, grafting and whether you should do it on pump or off pump. Now, uh, traditionally, if you're doing a coronary artery bypass graft, you'll put the patient on a bypass machine. Yeah, that's the on pump uh, way of doing it. Uh, and then um, uh, people then thought that uh, putting patients on the bypass machine required a manipulation of the aorta and increased risk of stroke. And then people uh, started to do bypass on the beat beating heart. That's what uh, they refer to as the off pump. You've got to keep in mind that I'm no expert here. Um, so there was this debate between on-pump and off-pump uh, CABG. And there were a number of studies that said, well, if you're able to um, do the anastomosis on the beating heart, at least in the short term, you will have a number of benefits. And there were some studies to that effect. But um, if you look at the long-term uh, impact or the long-term benefits and risks of um, off-pump uh, CABG. The long-term studies uh, um, show that the mortality is actually better in the on-pump group. And I've got this table from this paper published uh, four or five years ago that shows that the mortality um, is, um, is favors the on-pump group. And so this is a good example, I think, where the short-term outcomes might favor one arm, whereas the long-term outcomes might favor the other arm. And that therefore that's important to keep in mind when you're uh, looking at an RCT of a new technology you might be interested in to uh, think about whether um, important long-term outcomes have been incorporated in the RCT. And if not, whether it is possible that despite some short-term benefits, there might be some long-term um, adverse sequelae. Okay, so, um, although RCTs provide the basis for level one evidence, you've got to think about uh, the potential limitations. We've discussed just a couple here. Um, so the most important thing or the first thing that we discussed was that the results of RCTs may not be generalizable to your own practice uh, and that the results may not be in sync with uh, observational studies. Okay, the second thing we discussed um, is that um, you've got to think about whether um, long-term outcomes have been studied. Uh, you've got to accept that in many, many RCTs, long-term outcomes are very difficult to incorporate. And um, given that uh, there is this distinct possibility that the long-term outcomes may not necessarily be as favorable uh, or in line with the short-term results. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast.